Nine coffees. Hey, if you've got a Bible there this morning, can you turn with me to Luke chapter 9, please? While we're turning there, just a, a, a quick reminder, who's still been praying on Thursday, who remembered to pray on Thursday? Good, I hope you did. Uh, we've got one, oh, awesome, kids over here will pray on Thursday as well. Um, <coughs> we've got one more Thursday, so we're just going to keep banging that nail, keep, keep praying. Uh, we're specifically at the moment praying for the people that come along uh, here to arise. There have been a lot of battles. Who, who's gone through a battle in the last month? Can I see a show of hands? Don't be embarrassed. Put your hands straight up so everyone around here can see you're not alone. Um, whoever told you that when you came to Christ that it would all be cookies and cream told you a big fib. It's not true. As a matter of fact, I don't even know where they get that from. Jesus never hinted at that. He never said that. In fact, I was reading the other day in Thessalonians, which was one of the first sort of churches that Paul planted on one of his first missionary journeys. And he writes a letter, uh, sorry, it, it says in Acts that he, he, he went around to these churches, he plants them, and on the way back, he went, did it the same circuit. So he could go back to those churches he planted and, and just encourage them. And he went back through Thessalonica and he said to them, here's what he said, I want you to imagine this, it's a new Christian's class, right? You've just given your life to Jesus. And Paul comes through and here's what he says, you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven through many trials and tribulations. Who's, whoever heard that at their new believers class? The first thing they do, you've come to faith in Christ. Now let me tell you some good news. Uh, you are going to get hammered and beaten. The enemy hates you. People are going to mock you. It's going to be terrible, but praise God. <laughs> How many of you know it's true? We have an enemy that doesn't like us and we have a world that unfortunately is listening to the voice of that enemy and its affection for the church is waning. Loves what the church does. We don't mind you helping the poor. We don't mind you starting social services and we don't mind you doing all the practical stuff and making our life comfortable in this temporal existence. But don't you talk to us about Jesus and eternity. We don't want to know about it. I hope and pray every person in this room that our eyes are open to see that's the world that we're entering in uh, right now. That's what's happening. I believe in years to come, we're going to look back at this moment of COVID. You, two years, I'm going to call it. In two years' time, the church will look back in the West and we'll see that this was a real delineation mark for the church in the Western world. This was a moment. You know, I was at a, um, a gathering of, of um, <coughs> Christian leaders recently and uh, we'd organised to, to gather together and to seek God and pray. And um, part of my role in that committee was to contact other Christian leaders and say, look, we're getting together, would you come? And I must admit, I was frustrated at, at, at some of them who decided that COVID was the reason why we wouldn't gather with other Christian leaders to seek God and to pray. We won't gather because of COVID. And I thought, well, first of all, stop using that as an excuse uh, when you haven't been coming to any of our other meetings anyway. Um, just say you don't want to be there. But I, I wonder, these people that we don't want to gather with other believers, but hey, I'll tell you, let me tell you this. Our hygiene protocols are great. We're, we're cleaning things. We're doing all the stuff. And it's not just us. I'm, I know other churches are doing it. We're, we're making sure that everything is COVID clean and friendly. Um, we've got, got uh, people here, uh, and this is one of the beautiful things about the church. I'm going to assume everyone's this person. You care for other people other than just yourself. So, so you're trying to do the right thing, not just by yourself, but by everybody else that gathers. I can go to supermarkets and I can tell you right now, I'm watching people grab things, look at them, put them back on shelves, not wiping, not caring. I'm watching people shove back into each other, walking down with, 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 with coughs and sniffles and they don't care about anything but getting their Cocoa Pops. It's all they care about. And so we, we, we'll still go to the shops and buy our groceries. We're still going out for coffee. We're still going all these other places. We're still going to watch our sporting events. But we're going to use COVID as a reason why we don't gather together. Now, I'm blessed. I'm looking around here going, look, I, 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 I'm not having a go at anybody. Uh, but I'm just saying that we need to realise that this COVID is going to become, prophetically, I believe, a line in the sand for the Western church. It's going to be a moment we're going to look back to. And it's almost like a separating. It's almost like a point. If you're looking for a reason to get off the Jesus train, here's your reason. Right now, you've just been handed a reason on a platter. Get off the Jesus train. Separate yourself a little bit from the church. The yeah, Bible talks about as the, as the world goes on that the church is going to uh, uh, become less and less attractive, that we're going to cop more and more persecution and people are not going to like our message, you're not going to like what we stand for. And so you're going to have a lot of people that will go, well, I don't like what the church stands for either, so in order to not be associated with that, I'll also separate myself and in doing so, you'll weaken your own witness and your own faith. There's never been a time where it's been more important for us to pull together and to see beyond what's going on in the natural and discern spiritually, this is a moment for the church 
Amen. This is a moment for the church. And I'm, I, I, I say that every week. Uh, I, I, I pray and give thanks to God every week that we've got people that are still uh, are showing up. Not because there's anything magical here. Not because, you know, Daniel's worship is the only kind of your best anointed worship you're ever going to get. Or, 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 or Although, I look, I love it. I'll, I, I would prefer to be uh, under Daniel's worship than any person I know. And that's the truth. I, there's a spirit that comes out when you lead us in worship, Daniel. You're, it's like you're out of the way. We don't even see you. We just see heaven. And you don't get that all the time, so be encouraged. And it's not that my preaching is the best. I'm, I'm not the best communicator in the world. It's got nothing to do with that. But we recognize and understand that we need to gather together. We need to be together. We, we, we need to stand. We, we need to be obedient to God regardless. We need to, to trust him. And I think as time goes on, we're going to look back. We will. We'll look back and we'll go, man, 2000. Uh, 2020, whatever it is. It's 2020, I've lost track of the year. 2020, it was, a, it, was a, it was a prophetic mark in the calendar of the church going forward. And let me just encourage you, let's, let, let's not just uh, uh, be, 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 be believers that look at everything in the natural. Let's be discerning of spirit. Let's listen to the Holy Spirit because there's, there's a dimension to life that's beyond what you taste, see, touch, smell and feel. There is a spiritual dimension and there is things going on in that dimension. And COVID, uh, even though humanity and people have slowed down and stopped and we've almost been told put tools down and just kick back, the devil has not. He's still doing what he does. So we've got to be discerning and stand against that stuff. And by the way, that's not my message, but that's just what's, it's coming out, it's there, and I've got to let it out so I can get on to this. Um, um, Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9. Uh, I want to talk uh, about discipleship again. We've been going on a bit of a journey of discipleship. And uh, last week we talked about this passage, we talked about it out of Mark, but it's the same passage. This week I want to look at it in Luke, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. It says this, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Yeah, there's a, there's a sequence to what Jesus is talking about here. And if we don't understand the sequence and we don't sit back and look at our own world in connection to the sequence of what he's talking about, we'll find it very hard to completely understand what discipleship is. We'll take shortcuts and think we're disciples. You know some of the most frightening passages in the Bible, Matthew 28, isn't it a frightening passage? Many will come in that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we heal the sick in your name and raise the dead and cast out demons and all this stuff? And he doesn't say, no, you didn't. Why? Because his grace was there for that sick person, so he healed them. His grace was there for that person in bondage, so he, yeah, he did. He never said, I didn't do any of that through you. He just said, here's the deal. I might have done all these things. I did them. I healed. I delivered and so on. You, were, you might have been there and I might have even gone through you. Out of grace and mercy for that person that I died and loved so much. But you personally, I didn't know you. I didn't know you. Isn't that a frightening story? We did all these things. In other words, on the outside, we looked like we were powering on for God. And other people watching us probably thought we were powering on for God because, oh, we, we, he prayed for that person and she was healed. He cast out that demon. He did this. But they stand before God and God says, you know what, depart from me because there was no intimacy between you and me. There was no relationship between you and me. Luke, Luke chapter uh, 6, I think it is 46, where Jesus tells the story of the wise and foolish builder. And he starts it in verse 46 by saying, Why do you call me Lord, but not do the things I say? Why do you call me Lord? But when you examine your life, you, 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 don't, really, you don't really do anything I ask. You're not really living the way that I've, with the blueprint for life I've given, you're not really doing any of that. Why, why, why are you calling me Lord? Does it impress other people? Because they heard you say to me, Lord, Lord, are they impressed because they think something about you? But at the end of the day, when my heartbeat stops beating and I fall down and I leave this tent of a body, this ever-expanding tent of a body, I'm going to stand before him by myself. And, and what's going to matter is... My response to him out of relationship, not did I look like Billy Graham. I mean, did I, I'm not Billy Graham, I'm Alan Kirchin. And, 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 and did, I, did I make the choice to follow God? And, and, and did I work out what it meant for me to deny myself, not how you do it? And did I work out what it meant for me to take up my cross, not 
imitate somebody else? Did I work all this stuff out? So we're looking at this issue of discipleship, and I think if we understand this passage, we can understand discipleship on a whole. If we get this passage wrong, then we can come up with all kinds of weird and wacky ideas about what discipleship is. And it is sequential. Last week we looked at the end result. The end result is this, and follow me. And last week we looked at what, it, what the end result of what God's doing with us is that we would follow him. Not that we would become religious, not that we would become morally astute people, not that we would look a certain way. He wants us to have a relationship with him and actually uh, to follow him. That word follow, that word follow actually means to follow one who proceeds, to accompany him, to join him as his attendant. Think about that. When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, what he's saying is take up your cross and join me as my attendant. What a great picture we're not out there just trying to do, God's not standing there going, you go and do something and you do this and you, no, he's saying, follow me, join me as my attendant. I want, I'm going to do things and you're going to be my attendant. You're going to be working with me in whatever it is that I'm doing. That's the end game. That's the goal of the Christian life. That's what maturity looks like. See, maturity gets beyond God, you exist to fulfill my needs and wants. God, you exist to fulfill my agenda And to do whatever it is that I request. The more we go on in maturity, we realise that, you know what? It's the other way around. I exist down here for this tiny, tiny amount of time to fulfil the will of God on earth. It's not about what I want. It's about what he wants. What's the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Kingdom come. Whose will be done? Your will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. So God's got a will in heaven that he wants done down here on earth. I was just thinking about this the other day, and I don't want to preach on this, but the power of prayer. In the beginning, God said, what did he do? God is down here, and God says, God speaks, and things happen. It's almost like in order for for, for the will of God in heaven to be done on earth, the principle's the same. He speaks to people who are down here on earth so that we will pray and speak out his will down here. And when God spoke it out, the Holy Spirit did it. And when we speak it out, the Holy Spirit did it moves upon that and does it. But how much of our prayers is, all? here's my list, God. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to do this. Can you fulfill my wishes, my dreams, and my needs? And God, in his grace and mercy, I believe that he, he works with us on that on a level. But the goal is to get to this place of, of, of maturity, this place of discipleship, where we realize that we're actually here to fulfill his purposes, his plans, and his will. Because God has a plan for planet Earth and he's got a a part for each and every one of us to play in that as well. And none of us can do everything, but everybody can do something, amen? Everyone can do something. There's a reason we're here. I love that picture, to join him as his attendant. That's the end result. (laughs) But here's how it starts. Jesus said this, if anyone desires to come after me, it starts with a desire to come after him. That's the starting point of discipleship. Now, when I say desire, here's, here's, what, here's what desire means in 2020. Desire is this strong emotion that comes from within me that wants to have what I want. That's what desire is. Uh, who desires chocolate cake? I just desire chocolate cake. Sometimes I'm sitting at home at night watching TV and I just get this overwhelming desire for chocolate. And I'm not a big junk food eater, as, as you can tell. I don't eat a lot of junk food, right? But every now and then I get this craving, this desire waves over me what about you? Do you like chocolate? You like chocolate? You do. You do. <laughs> and, I, and you get this desire. And desire, a man desires a woman. There's this, this passionate desire for a, a, a woman. And I, see, I walked over to you when I did that. It was just natural. I didn't even think about that. I just straight gravitated over here to Jackie, who's my wife, by the way, if you can't see that online. <laughs> We're free, but not that free. Desire is this, desire is, is, is an emotion. Now I want you to picture this. This is not what Jesus is talking about here. Now the context of Jesus saying this to them is this. Peter suddenly gets it. You're the Christ, the son of the living God, right? And then at that moment, Jesus goes, you've got it. And then he begins to say to them, right, now that you get it, let me explain to you, I'm about to be nailed to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna be killed, right? 
Peter then flips out and goes, no, Lord, this won't happen to you. Jesus then turns around to Peter and goes, get behind me, Satan. How's that from the penthouse to the outhouse in one click of a finger? One minute he's saying, you are, you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church. I mean, that's the penthouse. And then two sentences later, get behind me, Satan, you're the devil himself. So don't get proud. I don't care how high up here you think you are. Just in a moment it can turn. So stay humble. Everybody stay humble. And so Jesus has just unloaded and told them that he's going to die. And then he turns around and says to them, with that in their minds, if anyone desires to come after me. In other words, now you know where I'm going. Now you know exactly where I'm going. The, the, the blinders have been taken off and you get it. I'm going to die. Who desires to come after me? Anyone? <laughs> See, we think, when we hear desire, we think feeling. Let me tell you something. If desire was an emotion, they weren't desiring it. They were not going, oh, Jesus is going to die. We feel like we want to do that. Yes, we feel like that's something we'd like to do too. And if they did, Jesus would have stopped, wiped them and started with another 12. Because nobody wants to do that. You don't desire to be killed. See, the word desire here has nothing to do with feelings. Here's what the word actually means. The word desire is the Greek word tello and it means this. It means to will, to have in mind, to resolve to intend, to purpose. In other words, when Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, here's what he's saying. If anyone has made the decision to come after me, made the decision to come after me, following Jesus has nothing to do with feeling like it. But the problem is many of us follow Jesus as if it depends on how we feel. One day we feel, who woke up this morning and felt like a Christian? Wow, this is worse than I thought. I, in my, when I pictured this, I thought at least five hands would go up. I thought Chris would probably feel like a Christian. He looks like a Christian. Um, um, not Theo. Um, maybe Sarah. Sarah might have, you know. I thought for sure five hands, come on. Nobody felt like it. Who wakes up every day and just feels like praying? Mm, hit or miss. Look around the room. If you feel like you're the only person who sometimes doesn't feel like you feel like it, look around. Most people don't feel like it. You know what? There's nothing wrong with not feeling like it. Nothing wrong with it at all. Nothing wrong with not feeling like praying. Nothing wrong with not feeling like following Jesus. Nothing wrong with not feeling like a Christian. Nothing wrong with not feeling like reading the Bible. Nothing wrong with it. But we're not to live by what we feel like. Jesus is saying here very clearly, I've just told you that I'm going to die. I know you don't feel like it. But here's what I'm saying to you. Now that you know it, who has made the decision to come with me? Who's made the decision to come with me? See, the first step of discipleship is the decision to be one. The first step of discipleship is the decision to follow Jesus. And it is a decision that we make, not a feeling that we have. It's a decision that we make. The desire Jesus is talking about is a decision. It's not a feeling. The first building block of discipleship in anybody's life is this whole issue of decision. I wonder right now as I'm saying this, how many of you in your hearts know that you've made the decision to follow Jesus? I'll guarantee you there are people in this room and you're still thinking about it. If you're honest with yourself, you're still thinking about it. That's okay. It's like last week we talked about Klingons. Anyone go home and put that song into YouTube and find the song? Klingons on the starboard. Who did it? Hands up. Come on. Be honest. There we go. Kathy and Mick, I knew you guys would have. I knew that. Gee. God didn't even tell me that. I just I told God, Mick and Kathy will, Lord. I know they will. I was right. If you want to come after Jesus, you've got to make a daily decision to do it. It's a daily decision. Now, here's the thing. How do you know whether your following is based on a decision or feeling? How do you know whether your picture of following Jesus is decision-based or feelings-based? I've got a very, very simple thought I want to plant with you today, and it's this. Feelings produce inconsistency because they're forever changing and they're often based on external stimulus and things that are going on around you. If you have a feelings-based walk with God, it'll be very inconsistent. 
If you have a decisions-based, decisions produce consistency. When I've made a decision about something, truly, truly made a decision about something, then that decision breeds consistency in my life. If there's inconsistency in my life, then I've got to take a step back and go, have I really made the decision? Think about it. The things that you are consistent at, you've made the decision. You've made a decision about those things, whether you consciously or subconsciously have made a decision, but you've decided certain things need to happen in life. So I'm consistent. I have to go to work. I've made a decision to get out of bed every morning, go to work, and do my however many hours and come home. It's a decision. You might do it robotically now, and that's a beautiful thing, but you know what? It started with a decision. At one point, you got your first job, and you went to work for the first day, and you came home, and you realised, gee, work's hard. Didn't think it'd be that hard. Didn't look that hard when Dad and Mum used to do it. Look at how much money they get. I'm not even getting half of that. I don't know if I want to do this anymore. But you had to wake up on the second day, and what did you have to do? You had to make a decision. And what was that decision? Get out of bed, get dressed, Turn up again. And the third day, you had to make a decision. Now, most of you, I'm assuming all of you, we, you get up and you go to work now and you don't really have to wrestle with all that stuff because you've made that decision repetitively enough where now it's just natural. Some would call it a habit. Some would call it now it's a habit. This is what we do. But it started with a decision. Everything in life, everything in life starts with a decision. And becoming a disciple and following Jesus is no different. Jesus at no point said, just wait, I'm going to give you a fluffy feeling anointing and you'll want to follow me. And up until that point, it's okay. Do whatever you want. But one day a prophet's going to come and he's going to pray for you and fire's going to come out of his fingertips and he's just going to spit and fly and thus saith the Lord and he saith, he did it, he did it. I remember years and years ago, a long time ago, there was a guy, I won't say his name in case he watches, but he, he, he came to a meeting I was at in Brisbane. And uh, he, was, he, was, he, he used to, when he got up and preached, he would, it was like I had a butt rose on steroids. It was <laughs> like this. Just <laughs> he, he was a lovely guy. He couldn't help it, but he just spat everywhere. So one particular day, me and a bunch of mates turned up to one of his lectures. We sat in the front row with raincoats on. <laughs> the man of God didn't think that was funny, let me tell you. He did not think that was funny. He had a few words for us. I don't know if they came from the Spirit. <laughs> anyway, I remember one time I came forward because he was praying and he, and he starts praying and he gets up in my face and to the Lord's face, to the Lord's face. And, he says, and I'm just getting covered. I mean, it's disgusting. Yeah. And so what I did, I thought, well, here's what you do. When God is present, this is back in, remember back in the, in the, in the sort of 90s, if you didn't fall over, God wasn't there. Remember those days? If, if you didn't fall over, then the preacher would help you. Yeah, come on, be honest. We can be honest. We're at church. Who hasn't been pushed over at some point? I'm going to shove you. you know, I don't mind if God puts you on your backside. Praise God. He's put me on my backside on many occasions and has probably wanted to on many more for different reasons. But anyway, this guy's praying and I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to rock backwards under my heels and fall over and then it's over. You know, then he can move on to the next person. So I did. I just wanted to get away from the spray. Nothing to do with God. I just didn't want to be spat on. So I rocked back. Ooh, down I go. Laying there with my eyes closed, thinking, fantastic, this is all over. Next thing he gets down like this, and the Lord's face. <laughs> and I'm on the ground, there's nowhere to go now, and it's just covering me. Worst thing I ever did. Anyway, there's something in that for someone. Someone spits, don't let him brave you. Just say no, definitely don't fall over. It's not going to work. Starts with a decision. How many know that it's consistency that produces results in every area of your life? Who knows that? You can't do something once and expect to get the end game. You've got to be consistent with things. Okay? Well, consistency comes on the back of a decision. How many in this room? You need to start eating healthy on a consistent basis if you want to get health results. Who knows that? Yep. How, well, how many of you think if I eat one apple now and a carrot in six months then that'll, that's my nutritional requirements and I'll be fit and healthy. Who thinks that? It's not true. You've got to consistently eat well in order to get the benefits and the benefits are real. The benefits are real, but you're not going to get the benefits without consistency. And consistency won't happen until you've made a decision and that decision is I'm doing this regardless of how I feel, regardless of how difficult, regardless of how hard I'm going to do that. 
You, you need to exercise consistently in order to get the fitness results. Who knows that? You know, you can't just go, yeah, I ran once. But it didn't work. Look at me. It's because you ran once. You've got to do something more than once to get results. You need consistency. And you won't have consistency without a decision. If you're inconsistent, I dare say, you haven't made the decision. You want results, you need consistency. Consistency comes to us after we make a decision. You need to learn consistency in order to get the intellectual results. You're not going to become smart in any given field by reading one book or one statement and thinking, you've nailed it, look at me. Give me a job. I read a book once. I read a quote on Pinterest and it was so great. I know everything. No, you don't. No, you don't. You've got to consistently have input, consistently turn up to lectures at university, consistently read your textbooks. If you want to learn and grow intellectually, you can't just read something once. It's like a muscle that has to keep being exercised. Decision is like that. It's this muscle that we just got to keep working, keep making the decisions, it's daily decisions. And those decisions build and build and build and they produce results in the end. But the decision is, I'm not going to give up. I'm just going to keep going because I've made my decision. This is who I am. This is what I want out of life. This is where I'm going. You need to show appreciation consistently to your spouse if you want the results of a good marriage. Yeah, see, she's preaching this one up. Come on, honey. Woo! I can never read her when she's giving me signs at church. I don't know what they mean till afterwards. I was preaching in a church probably 20 years ago and I'm preaching away and she's sitting in the front row. Got to a certain point and Jackie's going like this. And I thought, yeah, she's going, come on, honey, right here, go. So I get wound up and I'm preaching and I'm going hard for another 25. And then at the end she goes, what were you doing? I said, yeah, thanks, honey, you were stirring me on. She said, I wasn't. I was saying, you're going too long, wrap it up. <laughs> I just can't interpret things well. <laughs> but you've got to be consistent. In your relationship, if you want to build a good marriage, consistently praise one another. Talk one another up. Adore one another. I heard a guy say once that uh, he heard the story about a man that, that his wife came to him and said, I don't know if you love me. Do you still love me? We've been married 20 years. Do you still love me? And he said, I told you I loved you on our wedding day. If it changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> Not good enough, people. You've got to be consistent. In your praise, if you want to build a good marriage, you've got to be consistent in what you do there. You need to train consistently in order to become the best in your chosen field, sport, whatever. There's got to be a level of consistency. You've got to show up and show up and show up and show up again and again and again, even when you don't want to. Even when your feelings are saying that's enough. You've got to keep going if you want the result. Here's where I get to throw an uppercut at everybody. You need to be consistent in your spiritual walk if you want to reap the benefits of being a true disciple. You've got to be consistent in your walk with God if you want the benefits of being a disciple. Oh, I prayed once. And? Yeah, well, I read my Bible once. When I first became a Christian, I remember I read... Are you still reading it? No. Do, do you pray? Do you have any time in your week where you've made the decision, I'm going to pray? No. Have you made the decision to connect yourself with a body of believers? We call them churches here in the West. Have you made a decision to connect with those people? No. You can, you can come to a group and still not make the decision to open your heart and to be vulnerable and to grow in relationship with other people until you make the decision to drop your guard, to take the mask off, to be real to be a little bit vulnerable, to be humble enough to realise there are people in this room that can help you. But it's a decision. It all comes back to decision. And when we make decisions, decisions are things that we are consistent with and consistency brings results in any area of life. Let me tell you a couple of things that Jesus said just in regard to disciples. Here's a couple of things that Jesus said. It's interesting if you read the Bible, look at how many times Jesus made this statement. And, and when you do something, not if you do something. When you do, not if you do. Here's, here's a couple, some things to think about. And he's speaking about people that are going to follow him. He's speaking about, I believe, this is what Jesus assumes that disciples will be uh, doing in their world. These are some of the consistent disciplines, if you want, some of the decisions that, that disciples will make. Here's uh, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. Jesus says this. He says, therefore, when you do a charitable deed. 
And he goes on and says, don't do it in front of everyone, yada, yada. But he doesn't say, if you. He says, I'm, I'm just going to assume as a disciple, as someone that's following me, that's serious about me, when you do, I'm assuming that you will do charitable deeds. I'm just assuming it'll be a part of your life. It's a decision you've made to no longer just live for yourself, but you're going to start living for, the, for others. You're going to start not just thinking, what can I get out of life? What can I give? You're not going to start just coming, going, what can I take from people? What can I impart to people? What can I give to other people? It's a decision that we need to make. Jesus just made the assumption. He didn't say, if you feel like it. If you're someone that wants to, if you're someone, no, he said, when you do. Because I'm just assuming if you're going to follow me, that you're going to be that kind of a person. Go on a couple of verses uh, beyond there, Matthew 6, 5. He says, and when you pray. And when you pray. He didn't say, if you pray. Because he just made this wild assumption that if you're on this thing called discipleship, you've made the decision to follow him entails certain things. Call them habits, call them disciplines, call them actions, whatever. He said, I'm just assuming that if you're following me, I'm assuming that you'll be a prayer. I'm not saying if you pray. Here's the thing, because if I say if and I give you the option, you'll go back to how you feel about it and you won't do it. But I'm, I'm talking to people who aren't living by their feelings. I'm talking to people who've made a decision to follow me. So if you've made a decision to follow me, I'm making this wild assumption that prayer will be a discipline that will be a part of your world. Matthew 6, 16, he goes on, he says, Moreover, when you fast. Fasting's a, 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 a funny one these days because we go, I'm going to fast. I'm going to fast. Fasting for me means I'm not watching Netflix. I'm fasting Netflix. I'll just watch Stan instead. <laughs> <laughs> and we call it a fast and we think, hey, that's what God wants. You know, I'm fasting chocolate. I'm just going to eat marshmallows instead. That's my second favourite food. Salt and vinegar chips, you know. I'm going to fast the Xbox. No, for a week I'm going to fast the Xbox. Praise God I've got a Wii and a PlayStation as well. (laughs) And keep going. And a mobile phone and video games. No, no, Jesus said when you fast, he just assumed that, that, that part of that decision to follow him, part of the disciplines of our world would be, and I'm not preaching on fasting here, but there's something powerful when we forego food because food, is, it's, it's like the, the flesh within us cries out for certain things and wants certain things in life and you can, you can live without a lot of other things. You start depriving your body of food, it starts screaming at you. But you want to lessen that voice and allow the voice of the Spirit to come up a little bit more. By saying, hey, body, you're not in control. I don't live by my own desires and just what I want all the time. <laughs> but Jesus just assumed that if you're following me, you'll make certain decisions and you'll live a certain way. This is what it will look like if you decide to follow after me. John chapter 8, verse 31, 32. John, that would have got your attention there. We're talking out of John chapter 8, verse 31, 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him. He, in other words, he said to his disciples, Jesus is saying to you in this room, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. In other words, if you're my, my disciples indeed, you'll abide in my word. The, the, the discipline of reading this book will be part of your life. But it all goes back to the decision to follow. If you've made the decision to follow, then these are some of the fruits of that decision. We're people that pray. We're people that, that make time for the week. We're, we're people that make time for others for charitable deeds. We're people that make time to, to invest into the spiritual side of life. That's wrapped up in that decision. Here's the thing most of us, we don't do anything with, we haven't made the decision. So we're inconsistent in a lot of these things. And as long as we're inconsistent, we don't get the result. And we find ourselves one day going, I don't know why I do this. Why has God not come through to me? Why am I not hearing his voice? Why, why do I not feel his presence? Why do, why do I feel like he doesn't answer me? Why do I feel, feel, feel? Well, you know what? You're feeling everything because you're just living by how you feel anyway. You haven't made a decision. And people who say, I've got no time to pray. I hear my heart in this. I'm trying to be really nice at the moment. But if you're saying to me, you've got no time to pray, that's a decision. You've decided you've got no time to pray. It's your decision. I don't, I don't like to read. It's okay. That's a decision you've made. That. It's okay. Be honest, but just be real. You just don't like reading. It's a decision you've made that I don't like reading. And any decision you've made, you can make another decision. And it might not be easy. It might be tough. But you know what? Trying to get fit is tough. Trust me. I've just had six months of doing absolutely nothing because of COVID. Now I'm, it's ramping up for my sporting competitions I go away to and I've started running again. And you know what? It's tough. <laughs> It's hard. I'm, I'm trying to push my body. You know why? Because I know that there will be benefits. Every day my body says, that's enough. You don't have to do this. Just take a day off. 
Anyone else like that? We can be like that with, with, with prayer and time in the Word and fellowship, can't we? Just, just, just take a day off. Just don't pray today. And we don't have to because of some religious duty. But here's what I've found. Uh, when, when, when my, I said to Jackie yesterday, actually, we were talking about, uh, uh, I've got to have a run. And, you know, and Jackie, being the great comfort she is, says, I'll oh, just have a day off. I said, get behind me, Satan. But then I, turned, then, I turned around to Satan, then I turned around to Satan and went, no, that actually makes a bit of sense. I might do that. And so I did nothing. But here's the thing. I said, uh, here's, here's how it works with, with, the, with physical fitness. Is you wanna, when, when you're doing it and your body, and, and then you just start saying to yourself, have a day off. Nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing. On the second day, if you're saying to yourself, have a day off again, that's a problem. So I want to get to the point where I'm getting consistent in my habits. And, and when you start doing it, you start to want to do it. You get into a habit, call it whatever you want. And then if I have a day and I don't do it, guess what? On the second day, my body used to say to me, no, you need to go. I need this. And how many of us would love it if our spirit was that alive and that taken care of, that if we just had a day and we decided I'm not going to read or pray, not because of any religious thing. It's not going to make God love you any more whether you read a Bible or pray. God's love for you won't change. It's not about God's love for you. It's about you becoming a disciple and reflecting back to the world everything that God has for you to reflect back to the world. Excellent. We, 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 can, we can be poor reflectors of God, but still reflectors of God, or we can be bright, shining lights. We can be cities on a hill. We can be people that are... I remember hearing a guy say to me many years ago, he said, until, you, until your shadows heal and the sick, you've still got room to grow. And I grabbed a hold of that and thought, yep, that's, that's pretty cool. I like it. I've still got room to grow. And I know the only way I'm going to grow spiritually is to actually make the decision to follow him and outwork consistently those things that help me follow him. The, the disciplines of being a believer, the things that help Christians grow have not changed for 2,000 years. Pray. Talk to God. Listen to God. Do what he says. Read the word of God. I don't read the Bible. I just, you know, the early disciples didn't have a Bible. They just had the Holy Spirit and God. It's exactly true, but you know what else they had? They had the eyewitnesses who walked with Jesus, who kept them in line and knew exactly what Jesus had said and taught and did. Why do you think the Holy Spirit said, before you will die, I've got to write down what Jesus was about and who he was so that generations that aren't getting to stand with him in the flesh still know who he is and can still look back to him. Otherwise, these people that go, oh, I know God, but I don't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, then you don't know God. And you could be off with the fairies with all kinds of weird things. That's why the Holy Spirit gave us this. That's why he made sure these documents have been preserved for 2,000 years when nations, cultures and countries have physically and literally tried to burn every copy of it and wipe these pages from the existence of humanity. You're holding a miracle in your hand when you hold a Bible. A literal miracle. I heard about a little girl recently who said to her mother, uh, Mum, what's that book? There was a book on the shelf covered in dust. And she said, Mum, what's that book? And Mum said, oh, that's, that's God's book. That's the Bible. That's God's book. The little girl goes, well, we better give it back to him because nobody around here reads it. <laughs> is this all right? I'm not, I'm not offending anyone. If the Holy Spirit is offending people, I can't be held accountable for that. But, but you know what? I, I, I believe it. There's this, there's this delineation mark and time that we're living in. And the world needs to see what disciples really look like. Yeah, the, the church has been built on a lot of things. And a lot of those things have not been God. And I, 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 I sound like I'm a judging person. I don't mean to be. But we're not, we're not an entertainment industry. If you come along here to get entertained, I'm so sorry. Hopefully sometimes you get a bit of a chuckle and have a good time. But we're here to be equipped to minister when we walk out these doors. That's why we're here. That's what Jesus wants. He wants to raise up an army of disciples. And right now we're in a season where there's almost a separating of the sheep and the goats. And people are using COVID as an excuse and a reason why. That's okay. But this is a time where we need to be pushing into God and we need to be looking at this area and issue of discipleship. What does a disciple look like? Am I a disciple? Am I on the journey? Have I made the decision? Here's what I know. God empowers and anoints godly decisions. God empowers and anoints godly decisions. Um, I'm going I'm to finish up. I'm going to finish up here. 
If you find that you can easily live without something, then you probably never really made the decision that you need to have it in your life in the first place. If you feel like you can live without the Word of God, then I wonder whether you've really made the decision that you can't live without it, that it's food for your spirit. If you can live without prayer, then I'm just... I'm, get, I'm asking you to think about it and wrestle with God on these decisions. If you can live without prayer, then I wonder whether you've really ever made the decision that you want to live with it. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, it starts with decision. It starts with choice. Deuteronomy 30. I set before you blessing and cursing, life and death. And then like a game show host that was going to be fired the next day, he gives you the answer. Choose life. Choose life. I'm not going to hide the answers from you. They're in plain sight for everybody to see. I'm not trying to make it hard for you, but I'm not going to do it for you. You have to make the choice. Whosoever desires to come after me. Before we move on to taking up your cross and denying yourself, you've got to make the decision in your own heart. You've got to decide, do I want to be a disciple of Jesus or not? As time goes on, it's going to get less and less sexy to follow Jesus. Read the book. Read the book. They're not going to treat Jesus' followers very well as time goes on. So guess what that means? Less and less people are going to Feel like it. Are you going to be one of those? Or are you going to make the decision? Father, I just pray for each of us here this morning, Lord. God, thank you. Again, Father, we have we live in a COVID space, but we've got freedoms. And Lord, we're here today because we can gather and we can still get together. God, we can still hear your word. We can still um, God engage in worship. Father, we, uh, Lord, still have so many things to be grateful for in this time and season. But Lord, I want to pray for every person in this room right now. God, if there's anybody in this room and in their heart of hearts, they know they have not made that decision. And they know that because they are so inconsistent in their walk with you. One day they follow you, one day they don't. Then they do, then they don't. God, I pray for every person in this room. Would you, would you take them? God, to the very soul of their spirit. God, take them to the very core of their spirit and get them to wrestle with this question. Have I decided to come after him? Have I decided? Not do I feel like it. Have I decided? And then take them a step further. Let each person here examine their life. What in my life shows me that I've made that decision? And what in my life speaks otherwise? And Father, I pray for the next seven days as we go from this space. Lord, give each one of us in this place, give each one of us the opportunity to, to, to tell somebody about you out there, somebody that up to this point in life doesn't know about your love, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, your compassion for them, God. Somebody that doesn't understand the cross. Let us, God, be the people that take that message to them in the next seven days, Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys.